as many of you are aware, almost no one in my real life knows about this channel. But my friends do seem to have a vague understanding that I like crypto. So they often come to me with the news that they have discovered the wonders of Bitcoin. They talk about Sailor, Dorsey, Pompliano, the Winklevi, and the all magical number 21 million. At that point, I could immediately rattle off dozens of talking points about proof of stake and Gen 3 smart contract blockchains, and especially about Cardano. But I don't. I don't because I know I don't need to. I know that the first domino has already been toppled, and eventually that path inevitably leads, at least for intellectually honest explorers, to proof of stake and Gen 3 and probably Cardano. The sailors and Dorseys of the world may be too financially and socially invested to ever get there, but my friends will, and the rest of the world will too. We just have to give them a little time before they're ready for the real conversation. Ready? Við sendum ykkur bestu hvað er hérna frá Íslandi. Ef allir eru tilbúnir, skulum við keyra þetta í gang. Thank you to at Stageo Crypto for the intro. Today, we are going to discuss reports that 44 countries are on their way, or maybe have already arrived, to El Salvador. Some interesting questions about the future of Bitcoin security, how even Sam Bankman-Fried is now openly, publicly, philosophically bailing on the premise of Bitcoin, a Pavia airdrop, and Cardano at the top of the world. If you spend your evening sitting around in a suit drinking whiskey, endlessly tumbling dominoes because you're thinking so deeply about crypto, or if you're finding value in these videos each weekday, please consider delegating to the Army of Spies stake pool ticker AOS. We might just be living through historic times. This could be the beginning of the fruition of the crypto dream. Here we have Nayib Bukele, president of El Salvador, letting us know about something that could be pretty important. He says tomorrow, 32 central banks and 12 financial institutions, financial authorities, 44 countries will meet in El Salvador to discuss financial inclusion, digital economy, banking the unbanked, the Bitcoin rollout and its benefits in El Salvador. And then he tells us about every single country. Sao Tome and Principe, Principe, Paraguay, Angola, Ghana, Namibia, Uganda, Guinea, Madagascar, Haiti, Burundi, Eswatini, Jordan, Gambia, Honduras, Madagascar, Maldives, Rwanda, Nepal, Kenya, Pakistan, Costa Rica, Ecuador, El Salvador, of course, Egypt, Jordan, Nigeria, Senegal, Dominican Republic, Mauritania, Congo, Armenia, and Bangladesh. This is, this is something we've talked about in crypto since before Cardano was a thing, since before Ethereum was a thing. I've had, I've listened to, read, or had conversations about exactly this kind of thing. This idea that one day some nation state would adopt crypto. And as soon as that happened, that would be the first domino. And then once countries saw the benefits of a currency that not just wouldn't be inflated, but couldn't be inflated, then we would see the rest of the dominoes fall. Nation state after nation state would adopt the crypto standard because why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't they want a sound, hard money? Here's the thing. All these countries, all these nation states, they need to go through that same process that most of us went through, that most of our friends will go through when they discover crypto. They need to first become enamored with the ideals of Bitcoin. They need to understand the value of a hard money with a truly limited supply. Then they need to discover the value of expressivity, of being able to create smart contracts that can deal with that money. Then they need to understand the value of proof of stake and why we have to get to a world of Gen 3 
blockchains that are proof of stake and have sufficient expressivity that we can actually do something with this hard money. That's a process. You can't digest all of that once at once. You can't consume all of that at once. Just like your friend, you know, maybe if you have a really smart friend, they could go in an evening, probably over the course of many whiskeys. Over the course of an evening, you could take them from knowing nothing about crypto or Bitcoin all the way to Cardano. But for most people, that's not going to happen. First, they need to go through this period of being enamored with Bitcoin. Then they need to fall in love with smart contracts. Then they need to understand that this all needs to happen in proof of stake as opposed to proof of work for reasons of energy consumption. That's a lot to take in. And just like people, all these countries are going to have to go through that same process. We don't know how long it will take, but when there's so much on the line, when the economic futures of millions of people depend on making the right decision, I'm confident that a good, a good portion of these countries are eventually going to come to that, that same conclusion because while an individual, you know, democratically elected or not democratically elected or authoritarian leader, whatever, while an individual leader may fall in love with proof of work and Bitcoin the same way the sailors and the Dorseys of the world have, countries tend to cycle through leaders. And usually there's a change in ideas along with a change of those leaders. Not every single time, it's not every single time they change leaders, they change ideas, but they do eventually change ideas and make progress and arrive at better ideas. And a lot of these countries that eventually adopt Bitcoin are also eventually going to realize the value in smart contracts, and they'll eventually realize the value in the better energy consumption, lower energy consumption of proof of stake. Then they've arrived at Gen 3, and guess who's leading that race right now? It's Cardano. So while a lot of these countries may not be ready for the real conversation yet, the Cardano conversation, one day they will be, and will still be right here. And if your thinking is similar to Ruben Yap here, you might actually come to the conclusion that maybe Bitcoin's best days are behind it. In this thread, he asks, what if I told you Bitcoin also has a flaw, this is in reference to Terra Luna, also has a flaw in its design as well because of its, because of its 21 million limit. So down below, he points out, Bitcoin security relies on miners securing it. We know that. Miners are paid by emissions, these are block rewards, and by fees. Every approximately four years, this emission halves. This is the, the block reward halvening, halvening, and trends towards zero. The idea is that eventually miners will have their earnings completely in fees. This is all well known. This thinking has several problems, according to Ruben Yap. He says, first, it assumes that fees alone would be sufficient to incentivize miners once those block rewards uh, are nearing zero. The, but he says, the data shows that fees as a percent of the entire reward has been dropping. And he provides this graph. You can see some pretty big spikes uh, in between 2017 and 2018. That was a giant ICO, uh, the giant ICO bubble, and then another big spike during this recent bubble. But outside of those spikes, you actually have fairly few periods where, where fees are a large percentage of the entire reward. Then he looks at the actual number of Bitcoin transactions, because as I understand the counter argument, which is true that because of increased SegWit adoption, there's an effective increase in block space. And therefore it is normal to see this drop that's in the previous graph. But he says, let's look at another metric, the number of daily on-chain transactions. And he shows this, this graph, which shows that if you, even if you go back to 2017, the number of daily on-chain transactions hasn't really been growing for this half decade period. We have, you know, roughly, roughly the same number of on-chain transactions. Then he goes on to the next sort of counter argument, which of course is the Lightning Network. He says, well, this doesn't affect the problem at hand because miners don't make any money from Lightning Network transactions. 
only channel opening and closing. And again, what he's addressing is is the premise that miners miners uh, provide security for the network. And in order for that to happen, the miners have to be incentivized to actually do the mining thing. He says, what is more likely is that while adoption has increased, many still use exchanges to hold their coins and internal exchange transfers also serve as a kind of scaling. He says, Bitcoin's price is generally more than doubled after each halving, so miners haven't really felt the problem. Yet, since while they get less coins, the USD value is still more, but this can't go on forever, there will come a point where BTC becomes like a global commodity. The problem with relying on fees alone is it means that the security of Bitcoin is then totally dependent on how much the blockchain is used. We have seen that there are ebbs and flows in Bitcoin transaction numbers, regardless of the total market cap of Bitcoin. And we definitely, we definitely see that in this. Uh, we definitely see uh, sort of like a, a lack of growth in the on-chain activity over the last five years in this graph. He says, without block rewards, there can be massive variability in the earnings of the miners, which has severe consequences on security. In fact, there's a Princeton study on it on the instability of Bitcoin without the block reward. Without a block reward, security is no longer tied to the amount of value secured by Bitcoin. It is tied to the amount of transactions that is transacted in Bitcoin, which is a huge difference. And it is. He's saying right now, because of the block reward, the security of Bitcoin is tied to the very high value of Bitcoin. But once that block reward has gotten close enough to zero, it's going to be completely tied to fees. He says, some might argue, well, Bitcoin will still emit until year 2040, 2140, so we're still good. We have time. Here's where he makes, I think, a really interesting and important observation. He says, well, even in 2030, there's actually hardly any emissions left. It might as well be as good as zero. And I think this is probably his most important observation. If, you, if this graph is accurate, you can see even in 2025, we've pretty much gotten to the flat part of the graph. We can always quibble over how this graph is drawn, but you can see here each one of these little hash marks is about 6 million BTC in circulation. And each of these little spaces spaces is about 25 years, except for this period here, because the history of Bitcoin only began in 2009. So, I mean, however you draw this graph, it looks like you're going to hit a pretty flat part of the graph. He's Ruben's being pretty charitable, according to this graph, when he says 2030, I would argue that even in 2025, we're pretty much getting to a, a, a fairly, a comparatively flat part of the graph. Whereas for the for the history of Bitcoin up until now, we've been living in this period. So the question is, are the Bitcoin maximalists going to feel as comfortable about Bitcoin security when we get to this 2025, 20, 2030 period in the history of Bitcoin? That's a question. One argument would be, hey, maybe miners will just demand higher fees commensurate with their services in providing the same security to the network. Another argument might be that miners will move on to greener pastures. I guess we'll have to wait and see what this actually looks like in 2025, 2030. Another mounting problem for Bitcoin is that even crypto insiders, albeit each probably with their own personal bias and agenda, even crypto insiders are now starting to philosophically, openly, and publicly bail on Bitcoin on the energy efficiency issue. So much has been made of the inefficiency of the Bitcoin network over the years, and for good reason. It's a huge amount of energy being consumed by the Bitcoin network. We've talked about it before. There are very creative counter arguments about how Bitcoin is going to drive the development of alter alternative energy and how uh, Bitcoin can be used, uh, excess energy from renewable sources can be used with Bitcoin because you can start mining, you can turn on a miner at any point and a miner can be located anywhere. There's great, really creative arguments that Bitcoin maximalists have made, but it doesn't change the fact that the Bitcoin network is using up a huge amount of energy. And so even crypto insiders now are starting to openly philosophically part ways with Bitcoin on this issue. Here we have Sam Bankman-Fried. Sam Bankman-Fried, FTX chief, as billed in the title of this article, Bitcoin has no future as a payments network, says FTX chief. 
obviously he is tied to other blockchain projects that aren't necessarily linked to Bitcoin. So he has his own agenda here, but I think we're going to see more and more of this. He says the Bitcoin network is not a payments network. It is not a scaling network. Here, the Financial Times says recent research by academics in the U.S. found that Bitcoin has scarcely, scarcely been used for daily payments in El Salvador, despite the rollout of Bitcoin ATMs and other measures to encourage its use. This is what I was talking about. Eventually, just like just like all of my friends will eventually find their way to Gen 3, I think these nation states will too. Financial Times says the 30-year-old billionaire, Sam Bankman-Fried, who has expanded FTX into one of the world's largest virtual asset exchanges, said an alternative type of blockchain known as proof-of-stake or other technological innovations would be required to create a functional crypto payments network. They quote Bankman-Fried as saying, things that you're doing millions of transactions a second with have to be extremely efficient and lightweight and lower energy cost. Proof-of-stake networks are... He says it has to be the case that we don't scale this up to the point where we're spending 100 times as much eventually as we are today on energy costs for mining, Bingman Fried said. He makes he makes a good point here. We know in order for the Bitcoin network to actually be used at the nation state level, we have to do a lot more transactions. We look at the uh, energy consumption right now of the Bitcoin network, and we talk about it being the same energy consumption of these large countries, I mean, I haven't even looked at the latest numbers, but it's always some shockingly large country like Sweden, Finland, something like that. And then you think to yourself, okay, if we have to scale this, even if we only have to scale this 100 times, we're talking about 100 Swedens or whatever the latest country estimate is. He says FTX has used carbon offsets to compensate for the company's emissions but that's not a complete solution because you just run out of things to offset at some point. He says, I don't think that means Bitcoin has to go, but the token will probably become something like an asset, a commodity, and a store of value like gold. This is a really, this is really interesting. When you've got the most insider of crypto insiders publicly openly bailing on Bitcoin. They they used to be something that would have been considered like sacrilegious. And of course, you know, FTX and Sam Bankman Fried are linked to blockchains other than other than Bitcoin that are proof of stake. So he's got his own agenda. But this is sort of a sign of the times when even somebody whose whose own future is so in is so intrinsically tied to the whole crypto space when even a person like that is parting ways philosophically with bitcoin we're looking at a pretty big shift be aware that the pavia pavs airdrop has begun it looks like there will be six thousand of these pavs airdrop they say pavs will be roaming all over the pavia metaverse but these are the only paths of these 12 varieties, these ones that are being airdropped right now. So we'll see which ones of us end up with these things. Finally, we have made it, guys. Cardano's own Arthur Prestige has made it to the top of Mount Everest with a Cardano flag. He says, Cardano flag, 8,848 meters on top of the world. Thank you, Charles. When I get home, it'll be in the post to warm, sunny Colorado. To which Charles responded, you're not mailing that. It's too precious. Come have dinner with me when you get back and bring it along. I'm likely going to space in 2025. I'll take it up with me. Here's another view of Arthur and Sherpa Nerbu trying to get the flag out in the winds of Everest Summit. Arthur, I think the entire community probably thanks you for this. This is very, very cool. I hope everybody is having a great week, and I will talk to you tomorrow.